Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, another episode I know. Merry Christmas. It's, it's our gift to you. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 19th of December, and terrifyingly, there are only five praying days till Christmas. Forget the shopping. Yes. It's already very serious. <laughs> Gavin, welcome to the show. And uh, now, depending on how Protestant or how Catholic you are, I could wish you a Merry Christmas right now. But I probably shouldn't because most people would say, no, you can't do that, not till Christmas no, Day. No, we're in Advent, Kevin, this is that's Advent. right. And, and yes. <laughs> I, my we're greatest, preparing. My greatest joy as a consumer is to go out and you know, shopping at the uh, the grocery store or wherever I am, and uh, the person behind the uh, counter says, happy holidays, or have a good holiday. And I like to come back. You meant Merry Christmas, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yes, like, <laughs> but you don't really mean Merry Christmas because it's still Advent. But that's uh, that's well, the fun. You, you yes. try, try saying have an effective Advent to people. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> See how that goes down. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how traditional you are. Sometimes you need to speak the lingua franca. So I'll say Merry Christmas. And in the back of my head, I'll say happy effective Advent. <laughs> <laughs> effective Advent is right. <laughs> and it was. All right. Let's talk about the news uh, you and I sat down last week and talked about the, the I'm going to use the word damning, uh, report mm. against Lambeth and their desire to, from what I can read from the, the report, take down Bishop George Bell with no evidence. Um, and I'm like, whoa. It was a, we talked about it, watched the last episode. And then I said, I need to get Gavin on because we didn't talk about Justin Welby's quotes that were attributed in a Lambeth article about the report, where if you read the inference here, it's like, you know, the report's one thing, but I need you guys to think of uh, Bishop Bell in the broad sense of his whole ministry and not the things he did behind closed doors. Uh, ah, did he not read the report? And maybe this is an English thing that you just go with your 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 gut sense of things. Oh, excuse me. I don't know. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to put no this behind me. No racism in Advent. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? I'm like, what on earth did Archbishop Justin Welby throw uh, George Bell under the bus again for? And I said, all right, I gotta get Gavin on. Gavin, you saw the quote from last Friday. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, Kevin, this, is, this isn't a racist thing, although it is true that, that you and I know better than anybody else that we speak two different languages and have to translate and we work hard at it. So that's true. Um, I'm afraid I think this is Christianity 101. Um, I know from personal experience that one of the most difficult things in my life is saying sorry when I've got things wrong. Mm -hmm. Every so often I get passionately excited about something and I put a lot of thought and effort and invest myself into it and it's really hard or horrible when I discover that I've made a mistake. And the fact is it doesn't get any better as I get older, sometimes it gets worse. But it really truly is a painful part of being a Christian. It's absolutely essential for repentance. You can only repent by saying, Lord, I've got it wrong. My anxiety about this is we have a very serious situation here because just at the level of common sense, it's quite clear the Archbishop of Canterbury has made a very bad mistake. Um, and the issue is whether or not he can say, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Um, not not only on George Bell's behalf, but, but for his behalf. So the, the report itself, as you already know, um, I'm so embarrassed that you had read it and, and I <laughs> had a plus. I wasn't wrong. If I'd, know, if I'd read it, uh, I would have been much more forensic in my criticism. But now I have read it. And it's quite clear that the Church of England did appallingly badly. It's clear that the core group which was set up was not run properly. It changed over time. It's clear that it was not staffed with the right people it was staffed with amateurs who didn't know what many of many of them didn't know what they were doing with some notable exceptions it was clear that one of the most important things that should have been looked at was the issue of false memory syndrome for the witness it was clear that people who could have corroborated george bell's reputation because they were there uh, um, weren't able to i was very moved by uh, the independent witness of a girl called pauline who's now mm. an elderly lady 
Yeah. Pauline lived at the palace. She's the same age as the complainant Carol. If any, and it's well known that paedophiles have four. They hardly ever stop with one child. Uh, not only was Pauline living and running around the palace, uh, and by the way, she didn't remember Carol. She'd never seen her. But the place was full of Jewish children that George Bell had opened his his home to, the kindergarten, the, the kinder transport children. Um, I mean, how many bishops in the Second World War threw open the doors of their home to welcome in the children of the dispossessed? To then say that he did it because he was a paedophile is the most terrible thing to say. Was there any other evidence at all from anyone, anywhere, anytime, in any fashion? No, there wasn't. Therefore, you have to look at the at the possibility of, of false memory syndrome, particularly when the evidence was that the geography of the palace <clears throat> that the complainant Carol uh, um, described was not the same place as the palace itself. So now, in all of this, we're not we're not asked to choose between these two complainants, but we are asked, having looked at the evidence, we're very hesitant indeed about coming to a conclusion. Uh, we are invited to, um, as some people said, learn lessons from the complete incompetence of the church's process in this core group. At the very least, um, therefore, those in charge of this should apologise. The problem is that Justin Welby, in talking about the core group in 2016, said to the words to the effect of, this is a watertight process. Mm -hmm. We have done work well, professionally. You can rely on us. Don't defend George Bell. Back off. Now it turns out that this was utterly wrong. <laughs> and so either he must say, I was misadvised. I, I didn't really know. I'm too busy. I'm the, I'm the top of the management process. I'm running the Anglican okay. community. Well, that's understandable. If it could qualify an apology. In which case he says, um, I've sacked the people who lied to me. <laughs> or he says, um, I didn't tell you the whole truth. I'm really sorry. I, I was so pastorally concerned for this elderly lady that I allowed my judgment to be uh, uh, to get the better of me, in which case I'm sorry. And then I think all of us would say, look, you know, that was really quite noble. Of, you should be concerned for the bad memories of an elderly lady. It's understood. Well done for saying sorry. But to be unable to say sorry, to be unable to apologize, be unable to give an account of why he misled everyone in 2016 and then to continue to damn George Bell with this insinuation well it's really reprehensible and so I'm, and so even in the Times today the London Times um, has if I may just quote it because I'm oh, sure an absolutely saying, saying something similar and um, uh, I'd have quite liked it if they if they quoted me but never mind the truth is more important than who says it uh, Justin Welby faces a crucial test in this matter. It's a test of his integrity as Archbishop of Canterbury. The cloud that hangs in the air today is not to be found, as Justin Welby said, over Bishop Bell, but it's over Lambeth Palace. Mm -hmm. This is really very serious. We have, we have an Archbishop who cannot say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Uh, maybe Mrs. Archbishop knows this better than we do, but I'm for me... I find it consistent in how he's treated other people. Uh, you do remember uh, the the case of uh, Peter Ball? Mm. Okay, uh, Archbishop Carey was uh, uh, overseeing the case at the time, and uh, because of whatever happened back then, I don't know the facts, um, but Archbishop Carey was relieved of duty by Justin Welby for thing, sins of the past or unsins. Is this, did he use the same uh, watertight uh, investigation for Archbishop Carey as he did for um, George Bell. Is this just going to be modus operandi? This is the way it works. I say he's guilty. He's guilty uh, just by guilty by association. Well, here's the difficulty, Kevin. The problem is that, that Justin Welby is using entirely different criteria to let himself off the hook mm. than he used for George Carey. The George Carey episode was really quite difficult. I, I knew Peter Ball very well. I, I played squash with him. He was my bishop. I have to say, to my huge embarrassment, uh, he took me in completely. Um, it's true that George Carey had information I didn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, with a bit more care, um, he might have uncovered more of the truth of Peter Ball, and he should have done. Um, but this was a different age. We were not as alert as we are now um, 
to to the subtlety of um, of people who offend in this way. Um, but George Carey's mistake was a mistake. Um, to to turn around and punish one of your predecessors uh, by hauling him into the public sphere and and demeaning him in this particular way and requiring him effectively to step aside from his Episcopal ministry in retirement was a pretty cruel thing to do. Now, some might say, well, it was a sign that Justin Welby means business and nobody gets off scot-free. All right, we'll give him the credit for that. It's hard on, on, jo on George Carey, but if you, if you get to the top, things can be hard. But then he jolly well ought to apply the same rules to himself. Well, what are you Justin talking Welby about? Has made, <laughs> Justin Welby has made a, a mistake of similar proportions, I would say worse proportions than George Carey has, in which case he should consider his position and step aside. He shows no signs of doing that. I'm sorry, but that's hypocrisy. It is. Ah, it was fun to talk about. <laughs> You know, I, well, I I'm to, sorry. I'm sorry, Kevin. I don't take any. I, I apologize in case I seem smug about yeah. being right. It's too serious. It really no. is. We have, you know, one of the things we do in the church is we have to. We say to each other, "Look, you know, you've sinned or you've made a mistake," and the, and when we have, and we all do, um, I as much and more than anybody else, we have to say, "Look, I'm really sorry. Help me. Pray for me. Love me. Support me. Get me through this." But 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 you know, I'm sorry. An Archbishop of Canterbury is, is, is not in a position, no, no bishop, no priest, is in a position where he can escape the consequences of, of being penitent. Um, and, and the wonderful thing about penitence is it, it softens everybody's heart. The moment you say, I'm really sorry, I fouled up, please forgive me and please pray for me. Uh, the great thing about Christianity, unlike politics, unlike Islam, unlike any other religion, except perhaps Judaism, uh, is you get forgiven and you get to start again. It's okay to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It's, it's the genius, it's the grace that lies at the heart of everything we're doing because that's what Jesus came to make possible. It's so silly to waste it and to hide behind pride. Uh, and, and in this particular case, we can't, it's not, it's not proper to have I'm ranting. I'm sermonizing. I'm so sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, okay. I'm on the show for my good looks. You're on it for your perfect theology. Yeah, that's <laughs> the way it is. You, know, you can sermonize all you want, and I'll just sit here and look good. It's no big deal. Um, you know, it, 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 it's imper important to note that, you know, this is a Christian show, and how do we start this show every, every week? What do we do first? We pray. Of course. We pray. Uh, we pray about the news, we pray for the listeners, we pray for the people we're going to talk about. Uh, because these topics are hard, and uh, we don't want to, at the end of the day, do anything that's not going to be glorifying to God. We finish every prayer by saying, oh, by your mercy, Father, you know, let us glorify you with this show. Because uh, in reality, we're not we're not capable of it on our own. You know, that's, that's uh, a miracle of the Holy no, and, Spirit. And it's, and it's and it's very difficult here because one of the things that we're naturally doing is we we are exercising a critique. Mm -hmm. This is not the same as entering into judgment. No. <laughs> At least it, it, should, it should be. <laughs> so one of the things we have to do is to make sure that it, it's fair critique and mm -hmm. it is not the condemnation of other people. And sometimes those those things come very close to one another. So we if we would do everything we can to keep it in critique and and not judgment. This is a good place for transition. We're going to talk about. Uh, the announcement of the new Bishop of London. And one of the things I wanted to do is not make this about women's ordination, not to make this about the person who was brought forth and named to be the new Bishop, but to talk about the process of middle management taking over the Church of England, which I'm at this point, we'll just call it the secular Church of England, because it's really becoming a state church. Uh, yes, it, it is, and, and again, one can see why. Um, the The church has been very badly managed in the time that I've belonged to to it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I thought I could contribute to the Church of England as somebody um, who'd spent two decades in a university, where uh, was was to bring practices of sensible management to it. But it's like everything else. If you take something to an extreme, then you um, you begin to lose things that you needed to keep with you to, to, to perform a balanced picture. And the and it's true that 
after the wonderful mystical vagaries of Rowan Williams, people yearned for, <laughs> for someone to manage the church. Oh, be careful what you pray for, you may get it. <laughs> well, okay, now that's that's an important part here because uh, I remember the, the just a generation ago, you go to back 10 years, Bishop of Rochester, wow. Bishop of London, wow. You just go through all these different dioceses and there was some really good leadership, great theologians, great teachers, people who took you know Titus 1-3 to the extent, people above reproach. And it's the next bishop is the bad, you know, it, it, it's not like there's a transition of bishops. It's the very next bishop just doesn't meet the, the, the criteria to be a bishop, doesn't meet the criteria of a theologian. Is that a good teacher is at, you know, middle managers and stuff like that. It wasn't like this happened over years. It was the next bishop. Well, what, you, what you're really describing is the effectiveness of a political process behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So that for, for quite some time now within the Church of England, uh, there has been a, a management culture that was determined to, um, to, to favor people who had secular experience in the world. And in one sense, of course, you can see why. You you know, if you're responsible for an institution, you better run it well, right. of course. We're to be but, good but stewards. What, but what happens if the people who are so, in, so enamored by management don't have the capacity to see spirituality or holiness or some of the gospel charisms that are at the center of what it is to be a church instead of being an organization? And that's, that's my criticism. The people who sought to mend the in the organizational incoherence have done it far too well and they've done it in a secular and practical way and what we now have lined up <clears throat> is a is a list of people who have got lots of experience as managers um, and very good managers and I'm, I'm sure that the former chief chief nurse who's been made bishop of london was a really good chief nurse i bet she was really good at her job mm -hmm. as it happens she doesn't have very much theology she doesn't have a great deal of parish experience uh and and she's she's the, the, there are there are qualifications for being a bishop which leaving aside her gender entirely yeah, please, yeah. Are, 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 are lacking anyway mm -hmm. well actually i'm afraid i have to say I, I I don't agree with you when you, you say we shouldn't keep women's or we should keep women's ordination out of this. The the problem is that if 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 you're one of those people like me who have, after a long period of agnosticism, decided that uh, that the kind of the whole trans phenomenon that we're complaining about in secular terms is actually being imposed on us by confusion of gender. Sure. Then it really does. Then it really does matter. So, it, so it for people like me who hold to the traditions of the church, it matters on two counts. One is uh, the, the the gender it, it just in, in is, a, is a lack of qualification, but then the qualifications are also a lack of qualification. Uh, and in this particular case, um, so how do we do this without being personal? Um, we, well, we have a, what, what, we haven't even introduced, introduced her by name yet. Why don't you give us a, a quick biography of the yes. bishop? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so the person who has been uh, who, who has been elected or chosen to be the new bishop of London, which will happen in the spring, mm -hmm. is a very nice woman called Dame Sarah Mullally. Uh, Dame Sarah describes herself as a, an amateur potter. She's clearly a delightful, kind, and nice person. When she was younger, she fell in love with Jesus, whom she describes as her star. And many people have said, you can't do better than that. Uh, she was ordained late at the age of 40 after a, a really competent career in nursing. And she became um, uh, she became the chief nursing officer um, for, uh, uh, for the NHS. And then she was ordained uh, and, and did some theology and did some parish work and went to Salisbury Cathedral. Um, and quite clearly, as soon as she was ordained, found herself on a list of people to be promoted very quickly. And that's what's happened. Now, um, the, let, let us judge her by, by, but not by her, her gender, although I said for me, that's the most serious flaw. Sure. But let's judge her by, by her, um, her announcement yesterday. Um, she shows herself to be very concerned about safeguarding. Uh, if, you, if you look at her statement announcing her, if you like, her um, formula uh, 
for becoming form is the wrong word. What word am I looking for? Um, what are what are politicians manifesto? That was yes. the word. <laughs> if you look for her manifesto, uh, then essentially it's about multiculturalism um, sa- and, and safeguarding. Uh, at, at no at no point is um, at no point is the normal Christian language used about wanting to bring people to Jesus, to repentance, to new life, to salvation, uh, to bring them into the kingdom of heaven, uh, and to transform the world by holiness. Now, it's true these are all uh, these are all technical words for Christians, but on the other hand, you would expect a bishop to be able to make use of the technical words of the faith, or else to translate them in such an accomplished way that everyone knew what they meant in other in different language, and that's a, that's a difficult thing to do. But instead, she said her ambition was to make the church a safe place because. Effectively, that's what she understands it is to be a Christian. Well, I think it's very difficult. So the implication is that the Church of England currently is not a safe place. Well, that's that's one of the problems. Okay. One of the problems is when you say that. Um, but of course, well, I won't say of course the Church is not a safe place. There are no safe places. Right. There is no safe. There is no safety. Um, and the other the other difficult thing is that. Um, uh, that 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 she um, when she was interviewed on the on the radio uh, and they asked her some some question and they say for example they said St Helen's Bishopsgate has already said in advance that if you don't call same sex a sin they're going to break so Dame Sarah is same sex a sin and then in the time on and terribly weary way of 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 not very good politicians clunkily she sought to evade the question. Um, and and unfortunately, uh, I and a number of other people have therefore been, been quite disappointed when uh, St Helen's Bishopsgate has, after their after their threats uh, in the in the public media last week. I mean, they came out of a sermon, but they reported. They said, "Well, you know, we welcome her. It's all wonderful." Um, I didn't hear that. Really? Yes. As has as as has the blessed Rod Thomas. We welcome her. So it's fine. It's great. Okay. Well, let me back up to last Friday when we talked about this. I don't recall her being on the radar. Did we even talk? She, no. Uh, well, she she wasn't on the public radar. I mean, okay. uh, if I if I'd been very clever and I'm not, I would have said I would have said. Well, I happen to know because I did that there is you know there is a list of. Um, promotable women but but even I thought that was a bit too Machiavellian sure, to say okay, at right. time. Uh, even, even I thought the men might be in with a chance <laughs> clearly, clearly not I, I once again underestimated the formidable management skills of uh, of the people who run these things behind the scenes at Lambeth Palace there was no way this wasn't going to go to them and I have to say of course quite clearly she's going to be groomed to replace Justin yes I mean she's, she's I, I knew that right away you know uh, second career, manager, Archbishop Canterbury. Totally. Yeah. Or, or you know, or York, but probably Canterbury. Okay. And so, and so, what we have is is the feminization of the Church of England and the managerialization of the Church of England. Mm-hmm. And again, that would not be tragic if, along with it, went the charisms of the Holy Spirit. If if at the same time we had we had good management. Uh, and good spirituality, or we had holiness, or we had spiritual maturity, or we had, for goodness sake, even the marks of the authentic church, uh, then we'd say, well, this is great. We have the best of both worlds. My my great fear, as I look at the Church of England, is I don't see the kingdom. I don't see the Holy Spirit. I don't see the church. I see a religious organization. And, and, I, and actually, that causes me very deep pain. Yeah. But I, I'm going to look at it a little bit differently here. If I were GAFCON or AMIE or the ACNA and I wanted to do some work in England and I wanted to be to hope and pray that either the Church of England repents or they go way weird. Well, they went way weird. Uh, first in how they're treating, how Justin Welby is treating uh, uh, accusations uh of former bishops and way weird in how they're uh, hiring middle managers with very little theological um, depth to them. I'm, I'm, that's the best I can do. And so I well, think, I think that's is, very good. I, I, I wish I'd said it like that. That's, that's excellent. Right. <laughs> and so if I'm Gafcon, thank you. 
If I'm yeah. AMIE, yeah, right. If I'm the ACNA, whew, <laughs> thank God the Church of England's going all secular. And so, I mean, this is the right trajectory like we had here under Catherine Jeffert Shorey for renewal in the church, for taking a stand, um, and having the other characters um, be so flawed that what you're doing really looks quite holy and generous. And we're planting churches left and right over here in America because mm -hmm. of tech took a big turn to the dark side. Now, some of tech is trying to come back and you know, a good honored tradition in that is repentance, stop suing us. Um, I don't see the Church of England trying to come back for another dozen years. Uh, you've taken that track to the left, um, to the dark side, and you're going to be stuck in middle management, secularization, state church for at least a generation. And this will give time for places like GAFCON and the AMIE to really take a foothold, um, which was kind of our prayer back at GAFCON too. Well, you're right. I mean, let, let's call a spade a spade. Sarah yeah. Mullally was asked whether or not homosexual sin was a sin, mm -hmm. and she didn't answer. Right. So St. Helens Bishopsgate should have come out today and said, fine, we're now in a broken relationship. But they haven't done. Yeah. There are four or five very serious evangelical leaders of the big churches in London who are saying nothing about the moral and spiritual issues. They're keeping very quiet. And, and a lot of people are saying, why is this? Uh, we, are, we are critical of Justin Welby for failing his duty as an archbishop. But I have to say that a lot of people, uh, uh, and I, I'm amongst them, I'm not saying other people are saying this, I will say it too, that, that where are the prominent evangelical uh, leaders who are holding the Church of England to account? And the answer is they, they're keeping their heads down. Um, there are some people who are who, who are sharing that kind of integrity, and I have to say that the, the one group who constantly do it are, are the Free Church of England. And mm -hmm. I go on, you know, in the same way that, that the people wonder if you're being sponsored by Amazon for your plug at the beginning of the program. <laughs> some people <laughs> ask if I'm being sponsored by the Free Church of England, and the answer in my case is no. Is it's just admiration? It's mm -hmm. admiration for a group of Orthodox Anglicans who are paying the price and who are keeping to the faith. And, and because that's what's asked of us, we, to, to keep the faith and to pay the, be willing to pay the price. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Anglicans within the Church of England who are asking now, what can I do? Where can I go? And it would be helpful if some of the more experienced people who have their trust in leadership were to do more than just keep their heads down. That's kind of the, the modus operandi right now of the, uh, the evangelical church. I've never seen them more quiet on big issues. Yeah. Ugh. Well, it's been a nice program. It's a little long. That's our Christmas gift to you. Uh, 27 <laughs> wonderful minutes. Of... It's purgatorial. It's, a, it's Advent. It's, it's purging. Advent. It's Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so grateful to you guys. You know, the whole year you've watched the program um, and, and given us kudos. Um, I don't ask for donations. I, I like you guys to donate likes. Um, but Gavin, do you have a PayPal account? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do, because because I, I I have to take trips up and down to London, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, I, so so yes, I do. <laughs> so whereas Anglican TV doesn't need a lot of donations, I'm going to uh, start putting up links for your uh, uh, PayPal account and George's, so that people can show their appreciation, because a lot of people. Uh, you know, want to donate towards ministries and stuff like that. And I'm kind of being selfish by saying, well, I don't need it. Well, that's not true. I, it, many of our guests do and stuff like that. So my Christmas treat to my guests uh, and co-host Gavin and Alan and George is to put up your PayPal accounts uh, and uh, uh, let people honor you in, in, in certainly the way, the way they want to. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 356. May God bless you greatly as you prepare for Christmas and the coming of his love embodied in the past.